Thanks for joining us. You've tuned in to Arirang's Within the Frame. I'm Handan in Seoul. North Korea is set to commemorate its Foundation Day on September 9th, typically marked by grand outdoor events and large-scale military parades. The world is keeping a keen eye on the Hermit Kingdom as it might use the occasion to send a powerful message. And with just about 60 days to go until Americans head to the polls, speculation is mounting that North Korea may stage a major provocation to influence influence the U.S. election. Meanwhile, Pyongyang has recently taken a series of puzzling actions, leaving many pundits questioning its underlying motives. To help us decipher North Korea's latest moves and predict what lies ahead, our weekly commentator, Dr. Ko Myung-hyun, joins me in the studio. He's a senior research fellow, in, uh, fellow at the Institute for National Security Strategy. Always great to see you. Good to be here. And to add another layer of insight, we connect to Evans Revere, former U.S. Acting Assistant Secretary of State. Always a pleasure to have you on our show. Thank you very much for having me. All right, Dr. Ko, so September 9th, that's next mm. Monday. It marks North Korea's Foundation mm. Day, and reports are trickling in that it's making preparations for a grand outdoor concert. Mm. Uh, and some reports also say that many vehicles are mm. lined up in front of where they usually practice mm. military parades. Mm. Now, first off, what significance does the day hold for North Korea, and how do you expect the reclusive state to commemorate it this year? Well, first First of all, it's a national foundation day for North Korea. It was, uh, North Korea was established, or the, uh, Democratic People's Republic of Korea was established in, back in 1948 on September 9th. And uh, for North Koreans, uh, because they see North Korea as being the legitimate representation or representative of the Korean nation, the foundation of the country is much more important. Uh, for instance, the Liberation Day uh, that marks the liberation of Korea from the Japanese imperial colonial rule. So, uh, so they imbue this date with a lot of significance, and this is the reason why they are pre um, uh, staging all these different preparations, such as um, a large outdoor concert, in addition to the traditional North Korean way of celebrating a national day, which is a parade. So, uh, but on the other hand, I think uh, for the North Koreans, it's interesting that uh, North Koreans are also trying to spruce, spruce up the national image in the recent years. I think. Uh, and North Koreans are trying to uh, move away from the perception that the international community has of the country as a rogue state that develops nuclear weapons uh, illegally to something, to a country that's much more acceptable and with a better reputation, uh, more of a normal country. And I think uh, this is uh, part of the overall, uh, you know, in a way, like a um, propaganda campaign by North Korea to normalize the country, and by extension, normalize the leader of country, uh, country Kim Jong-un. And I think uh, North Korea is trying to project the image of a country that's much more important and powerful than it really is. So I think uh, it's likely that the North Koreans are going to spend this date more or less quietly without launching major provocation like before. And then to somehow, uh, again, like, uh, remark the fact that uh, North Korea has achieved a lot despite all the struggles that they are facing economically and in other ways. Uh, so I think it's going to be pretty, I want to mount an impressive show, but then at the same time, uh, good for us, which is uh, pretty much a quiet time. So no major provocation is expected oh. because North Korea is making efforts recently to present itself to the world as a normal state. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Revere, some pundits say that North Korea might view Donald Trump as a more favorable candidate for its interests and stage a major provocation to influence the U.S. election. Now, I know that you're not uh, very fond of making uh, predictions of uh, North Korea's uh, provocations, but what are your thoughts on this? Well, experience tells me you should never completely rule out the possibility of a North Korean provocation, including one around the time of the U.S. presidential election. But quite frankly, uh, such a, a step by North Korea would be, I think, extremely risky, uh, especially considering the very high state of readiness of ROK and, and U.S. forces. I'm also rather skeptical uh, that such an act by Pyongyang would have any significant impact on the electoral outcome in the United States. But to the extent that it could have an effect, I suspect it would not help Donald Trump, quite frankly. Uh, 
as I try to get inside the head of the, the North Korean leader, uh, I, I do suspect that he would probably prefer a, uh, a second Trump presidency. I suspect that Kim Jong-un probably hopes that uh, Donald Trump's anti-alliance skepticism, uh, Trump's past uh, tolerance of North Korean uh, missile development, uh, Donald Trump's unilateral cessation of major U.S. ROK military exercises, uh, and Trump's positive rhetoric uh, over the years about Kim Jong-un, that all of those things would lead to renewed gains for North Korea if Trump were uh, elected. Uh, but a North Korean military provocation in the run-up to the United States election, I think, would reinforce uh, the Democratic Party's criticism of Trump for having coddled the, the North Korean leader. And it would strengthen the argument that Trump has been rather naive in his handling of, of North Korea. I think a provocation would also underscore the importance of the U.S. ROK alliance and the need to further strengthen the alliance. Uh, those, of course, have been key priorities of the Biden administration and Kamala Harris. Uh, candidate Harris would surely contrast this approach with Donald Trump's less than positive relations with our South Korean ally when he was president. So even if North Korea carries out a major provocation, it may not have that much of, a, much of an impact on the U.S. election. And we'll That's discuss yeah. more about what Trump and Kim may exchange uh, later on under uh, Trump's presidency. But before that, Dr. Ko, mm. so the upcoming U.S. election, still, mm. it has uh, once again brought North mm. Korea's seventh nuclear test uh, into focus. Now, mm. we've discussed about this quite several mm. times, but uh, there are speculations that Pyongyang is now less concerned mm. about China's mm -hmm. stance on the matter mm -hmm. and that its next test might involve uh, miniaturized mm. tactical nuclear weapon. Mm. What are your perspectives on, uh, on, on these assumptions? Well, these are the assumptions that are always held true in no matter what time or period we are talking about, about the possibility of North Korea carrying out uh, major provocations like uh, nuclear test. Uh, and I think the reason why this kind of speculation to which I contribute to it myself uh, is rising again because as uh, Evans has pointed out, this is a pivotal year, uh, geopolitically speaking, for North Korea. Uh, this is a very important election year for the United States because depending on who gets elected, there might be a diametrically different opposite uh, policy or approach towards North Korea. So I think North Koreans probably want to take advantage of this situation to favor their uh, nuclear advances. And for instance, there's already a technological motivation or good justification for North Koreans to carry out uh, a nuclear test. You pointed out that North Korea has developed a miniaturized uh, tactical nuclear uh, warhead, and they need to test it. And, and this is a good time for them to test it in a way because North Koreans always try to achieve multiple objectives in, in one group provo on provocation. So they don't want to uh, let a good opportunity go to waste. So, so for, conceivably speaking, North Koreans could carry out a nuclear test that uh, further develops or perfects their nuclear technology. At the same time, sends a message to Washington saying that they're still alive and they are very much uh, capable of pro uh, causing tension, even like a major conflict, I would say, in the Korean Peninsula. So the Chinese show that uh, you know, North Koreans are not really dependent on them too much. They are strategically autonomous. And also, uh, in a way, when it comes to the United States, uh, North Korea, there's an additional benefit of carrying out the nuclear test at this juncture this year. Because if North Korea is expecting, I mean, now it's 100% certain that there's going to be a new administration next year in the United States, whether it's uh, Kamala Harris or Donald Trump. So for North Koreans, if they are thinking about uh, restarting the negotiation with the United States about making themselves uh, acknowledged as a nuclear state, what they can do is that they can carry out the nuclear test, perfect their nuclear technology, but then starts uh, with a clean slate when it comes to engaging on uh, government in Washington. So I think uh, this is essentially factors that are um, uh, allowing experts to speculate that this is an important year for North Korea to, or likely for North Koreans to carry out the much anticipated nuclear test. 
So uh, if North Korea does forge ahead with mm. its seventh nuclear test, it would be like killing several birds with one exactly. stone. Exactly. Mm. Dr. Revere, North Korea has reportedly added Chinese movies and TV shows to its banned list to the surprise of many. How do you analyze the current state of Pyongyang-Beijing relations? Well, I don't think the supposed ban on Chinese media tells us a lot uh, about the state, overall state of PRC, DPRK relations. Uh, as we all know, total control over information, including everything the North Korean people uh, read or see on television or in films. That's always been a core goal of the North Korean regime as it tries to shape the thinking and actions of its people and inculcate its ideology on them. Uh, whether Chinese movies and TV shows are on a so-called list or not, the fact is that these media products are rarely available for viewing by the general North Korean public, so that, that's nothing new. Uh, many of the themes, I'm a big fan of, of Chinese film, by the way, uh, many of the themes of contemporary Chinese movies are such that the North Korean regime would probably not welcome them uh, under any circumstances, and that's not uh, new either. Uh, as we all know, in recent years, Kim Jong-un has made a point of uh, trying to root out the influence of, of what uh, the regime calls impure films, shows, and music. Uh, clearly, he is concerned about the impact of uh, foreign culture and the possibility uh, that it might undermine the regime's ideological priorities. Uh, what the North Koreans uh, used to call the yellow wind of Chinese influence is probably a part of, of, of that concern. Meanwhile, uh, getting to the other part of your question, uh, North Korea-China relations are under some strain right now. The rapid warming of uh, North Korea-Russia ties, uh, Pyongyang's open support for Russia's war against Ukraine, uh, the possibility that Moscow may be providing North Korea with sensitive military technology, uh, and the DPRK's more aggressive stance against uh, the ROK. All of these things have contributed to strengthened U.S. support for South Korea, uh, increased deployment of U.S. strategic assets uh, to the peninsula and near the peninsula, an unprecedented uh, set of steps in strengthening the U.S. Uh, extended deterrent commitment, and also a uh, very robust trilateral U.S. ROK-Japan partnership. None of those things that I just mentioned uh, are in China's interest, and the cooling of Beijing-Pyongyang ties, I think, reflects this. So even in this year when China and North Korea are supposed to be commemorating the 75th anniversary of their establishment of diplomatic ties, the celebration has been uh, rather muted and it's been rather matter of fact. So uh, not all is well when it comes to Pyongyang-Beijing ties these days. So Pyongyang-Beijing relations, they are strained, but the recent ban on Chinese contents, they don't indicate souring uh, North Korea-China relations, but rather it should be seen as North Korea's uh, another effort to completely isolate its people from outside world. Now, Dr. Ko, mm. North Korea had registered 13 mm. military submarines with the International Maritime Organization, mm -hmm. but then removed them mm -hmm. from the list mm. just a day later. Mm. How do you see this puzzling move? Well, it's indeed puzzling because, you know, in these days and age, uh, registering uh, something online and removing later doesn't mean that the copy disappears. <laughs> in fact, uh, there are also going to be at least one copy or multiple copies of whatever data you enter into a website. So same with what happened just now. North Korea tried to remove the information from the IMMO uh, website, but chances that uh, the interest parties including the experts, uh, already have copies of this. So uh, there could be many different reasons why this happened. Uh, we can only speculate about the truth. Uh, but then chances that North Koreans, uh, what the intention by North Koreans is likely to be uh, calling attention to their uh, overall Navy scale of uh, prowess, you know, the scale and the, the quantity of ships they possess. And it's just in that North Korea only registers 13 submarines. Chances are they are way more than that. So I think they want to showcase uh, a number of submarines. They, uh, they, have, they, have, they are the larger ones that they want to uh, showcase to the rest of the world, uh, such as the, uh, the latest one that can carry, uh, according to the North Koreans, can launch a submarine. Uh, uh, launched ballistic missile. 
But uh, at the same time, I think uh, North Koreans don't want too much attention brought to their, to their uh, Navy. So it's, it's a case of North Koreans trying to get attention from the international community, but not too much attention. <laughs> so they yeah. want to brag about it, but they don't want too much scrutiny. <laughs> That's a uh, well, likely explanation. All right. Dr. Revere, uh, back to Trump and Kim's romance, uh, if you will. Trump has once again reiterated that he gets along well with Kim Jong-un and that getting along with him is a good thing. Uh, should Trump return to the White House, what would he offer uh, specifically and gain in return if he revives personal diplomacy with Kim? Well, all of this, of course, is happening in the context of the fact that uh, Kamala Harris has very strongly criticized Donald Trump's affinity for dictators like Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, and also criticized Trump for coddling uh, Kim Jong-un. I think that's really gotten under Donald Trump's skin, quite frankly. Uh, Trump is uh, defending himself by portraying himself as a, as a skilled diplomat who tried a unique way of resolving the North Korea problem. Of course, uh, nothing was resolved uh, during his administration. Uh, Donald Trump made some very troubling concessions to Kim Jong-un and the North Korean nuclear and missile threats grew significantly worse on Donald Trump's watch. But as with many things that Donald Trump does, he was very skilled at creating the illusion of progress when he was dealing with North Korea. Uh, there was a lot of showmanship going on, uh, but very little progress uh, was made uh, on the nuclear issue, uh, and the problem, in fact, got worse. Uh, I think if he wins the November election, it's not hard to imagine that Donald Trump would try to resume outreach in some way, shape, or form with, uh, with North Korea. Uh, but today, almost no one believes that there is any real chance that North Korea is going to ever give up its uh, nuclear weapons program. Nevertheless, Trump might try to pursue uh, another approach with Pyongyang, perhaps focusing on arms control or trying to limit the size of North Korea's uh, nuclear uh, and or missile arsenals. Of course, any commitments uh, and promises that he gets from Kim Jong-un would be as false and as useless as North Korea's other commitments over the years. And the North Korean leader, uh, I think, would demand a lot in return for making these false promises. Dr. Cole, North Korean Foreign Minister mm. Choi Son-hee mm. is expected to make an appearance at the mm. UN General Assembly mm. set for later this month. What do we know so far about her attendance and what sort of message do you expect from her? So, the, so far, the, the information that's emerged is that Choi Son-hee might come to New York, uh, as you said, to give a speech at the uh, United Nations annual uh, General Assembly meeting uh, by the end of the month, and that's about it. But uh, we don't know exactly the what content what kind of speech she's going to give. But then we can only, again, guess, uh, give an educated guess about what she's going to talk about uh, by looking at the timing uh, and also uh, comparing to what, what kind of speech North Korea's uh, foreign minister gave the last time and made an appearance at the UN General Assembly meeting. And the last time was in 2018. And that time wasn't Chae Sonny, obviously. It was somebody else, Lee Young-ho, uh, who was rumored to be having purged by Kim Jong-un. Uh, so I think, and then, but then, uh, nonetheless, uh, what uh, Lee Young-ho said uh, last time in 2018 was very threatening, I mean, in a way. I mean, not threatening, but then it was more about uh, marking the fact that North Korea made uh, uh, major diplomatic strides. Uh, and then I think uh, it was a major speech for the North Koreans in a way. So chances that Choi Son is coming to New York uh, uh, to give an important speech and that it's going to contain an important message for the rest of the world. I don't think it's going to be about engagement. Uh, the reason is because it's not going to be clear who's going to be in power next year uh, in uh, Washington. So it's going, going, going to be about the fact that North Korea is now a nuclear state. Uh, they are being, in fact, uh, implicitly being acknowledged as such by the major powers, uh, such as China and Russia, especially Russia. I think uh, it's going to be an important part of the speech. And also, there's going to be a heavy criticism against the uh, uh, United States and Japan and South Korea. So, uh, so we can think that's going to be the, uh, probably the 
or the likest, uh, likeliest uh, uh, parts of the speech. And, but then there could be a surprising uh, message uh, hidden uh, between the lines and, uh, ch and probably uh, some sort of a, you know, in enticement for the incoming or next uh, U.S. administration to open up a dialogue uh, with North Korea. Uh, but this time, the agenda item that the, the two countries are going to discuss is not going to be a, about democratization of North Korea, rather about treating North Korea's uh, power it is and, and somehow bring stability to the region. Choi Sun-hee is expected to give a speech on the 30th, mm. so we'll be sure to keep our eyes fixed on her that day. Mm. And our final question for you, Dr. Revere, today, South Korea and the United States will meet in Washington, D.C. today, local time, for the fifth meeting of the Extended Deterrent Strategy and Consultation Group. What will be the central issues? I think this dialogue is going to serve as a very uh, useful reminder that the uh, United States and the ROK uh, are uh, joined at the hip when it comes to talking about extended deterrence, uh, that this uh, dialogue is alive and well, uh, that senior officials are engaged uh, in these talks, and that the, the joint task uh, between Washington and Seoul of strengthening deterrence has the strong and ongoing commitment of, of both governments at the highest levels. Uh, some scholars and media outlets uh, have been raising concerns about the reliability of the U.S. extended deterrent commitment, and others are pushing for the ROK to consider going nuclear. I think this meeting is going to be an important mechanism to assure South Korea that the United States stands behind its commitments and that South Korea is a clear partner in the process of discussing ways to strengthen deterrence. And that's a good thing. It's a good message. All right, Dr. Revere, thank you as always for your perspectives. You're welcome. And thank you, Dr. Goh, for your presence with us today. We appreciate it. It is my pleasure. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you for watching and be sure to tune in same time tomorrow to join our conversation. Goodbye for now.